slowing down because I'm of gonna go, I'm going to go over here. Just oh, oh, okay. Um, you can go. do it.
We welcome everyone who gathers in the house of the Lord this morning. My name is Hughes Williamson, uh, and I am the lay liturgist for today. In the form of announcements, uh, we ask that you please fill out the Connect card, which is found in your bulletin, to let us know you're here and to keep up. Keep us up to date on any new information, prayer requests, or praise reports. Our Sunday summer school, Sunday school group, Fellowship, Friends, and Faith, is meeting in the Fellowship Hall each Sunday at 10 a.m. And our final uh, session will be August the 6th, next Sunday. We will be hosting two events in August to recognize college students. The first event is a lunch on August 17th in collaboration with the Wesley Foundation. We will also be recognizing college students the following Sunday, August the 20th. If you're interested in volunteering for either of these events, please call the church office. There's still time to join the choir. August is our informal camp meeting style worship and choir rehearsals start back September 6th at 7 p.m. Talk to Jackson Borges or any choir member for details. We have a few open positions on our staff. If you are interested in the business administrator or student ministry assistant position, please contact Reverend Doug Fairbanks. For our children's ministries, promotion Sunday is August 6th. Pre-K through fifth grade, come start off the new year with a bang. We'll have breakfast treats, games, and new Sunday school teachers for you to meet. See you on August 6th at 10 a.m. And at this time, Miss Janice Smith has an announcement. Good morning. How is everyone? It's great to be in the house of the Lord. My name is Janice Smith, and I'm a member of the United Women in Faith. We formerly were known as the UMW. And back in the days of my great-grandmother in Paris, Texas, who was, uh, at the time, it was called the WSCS, Women... I have forgotten. <laughs> Women, WS, Service, Christian... Anyway... That was it. There you go. It was, uh, but it was known as the WSCS, my great grandmother. Now I'm not super young, so that goes back a long time, and I still have her little gold pen from those days. So there's a legacy of that in my family. But for over 150 years, uh, in the Methodist tradition, uh, we put faith, hope, and love into action. And we joined together to help women, children, and youth within our community, state, and all around the world. We work to support a fellowship of Christian women with organized activities, mission education, and financially, we support in our state the Open Door Community Ministry in Columbus, the Vashti Center for Children and Families in Thomasville, and the Wesley Center in Savannah. Locally, and I know locally is what we can kind of see here and touch right here, we do great things in our own church, and I say great things because funeral meals for families during bereavement are something that we, we have done for many, many years, and we join together as a circle and provide a meal uh, after a funeral or at the family's request. Uh, we also provide goodie bags to health care workers. And we create birthday bags that has everything in it that you would need to make a birthday cake for folks that wouldn't have one otherwise. And through ACTS and Open Hearts Community Mission, Fostering Bullock, Safe Haven, and we just work on behalf of children, youth, and adults, and especially women. So we encourage our missionaries all over the world uh, by letters of support, but also financially. And there are missionaries, uh, Methodist myth missionaries everywhere. Our, meet, our group, our unit meets uh, the, the August through April, the second Monday of each month at 10 o'clock. 
and we have good fellowship. We always have a prayer. We have a we have a little sweet short program, and we just encourage the ladies of the church that would like to join us. We would love to have you join our fellowship. You'll get a big blessing out of it yourselves, and and uh, I hope we'll. Uh, encourage and you don't have to be a member you may join encourage your friends and neighbors to join the United Women of Faith thank you stand as you're able for our call to worship. <laughs> oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call on God's name. Make known God's deeds among the peoples. Sing to the Lord. Sing praises. Tell of all God's wonderful works. Glory in God's holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek the Lord's presence continually. Remember the wonderful works God has done, the miracles and judgments God has uttered. O offspring of Abraham, God's servant, children of Jacob, God's chosen ones, the Lord is our God whose judgments are in all the earth. The Lord is mindful of his everlasting covenant of the word commanded for a thousand generations. The covenant made with Abraham, his promise sworn to Isaac, and confirmed to Jacob as a statue, to Israel as an everlasting covenant, saying, To you I will give the land of Canaan as your portion for an inheritance. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your faithfulness in our lives. It is because of your loving kindness, care, and protection that we are here. Thank you because of gathering us here today for this service. We call unto you to guide this service, accept all our sacrifices of worship, praise, and prayer. Forgive our sins so that we are acceptable before your presence. Allow your Holy Spirit to be in our midst. As we start this service, may you be glorified from the beginning to the end. Please give us your peace that we may be able to listen to you. We pray this in the name of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please remain standing for our hymn of praise, number 139, Praise to the Lord the Almighty.
confirm together the historical affirmation of the, Christ, the Christian Church, the Apostles' Creed, located in your hymnal on page 881. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sat at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. to include these names. We continue praying for Gene Deal, Linda Arnold, Dot and Steve Piazza, Shirley Cannell, Betty Rushing, Charlie Milliken, Brenda Forbes, Sarah Betty Cook, Nancy Hess, Russ Lanier, Diane Deloach, Bill Hatcher, Lynn Bennett, Faye Berkeley, and Georgia Kate Anderson. For everyone in every nation who has lost loved ones and were in war, violence, or tragedies, every week we pray for health care workers and first responders, our nation's military, and the civilians who support them, and government leaders at every level. Let us pray. Would you join me in prayer? Gracious Heavenly Father, we again give you thanks for the chance to be in your house today and to worship you. We give you praise, Lord, for your goodness, for your loving kindness. We know you are always good, Lord, even when we can't see it. You are always worthy of praise. Please forgive us when we lose sight of that when we get distracted by other things, when our hearts turn away. Let our hearts be open to your Holy Spirit and guide us gently back. Please forgive us for the ways we haven't loved you with our whole hearts, for the ways we haven't loved our fellow human beings as ourselves. Lead us back to the right path. And Lord, today we've mentioned these names, God, and we, we lift up these people to you as well as people in our community, our healthcare workers, our first responders, our policemen and women, our leaders. Lord, we do pray, we pray for healing for those in need of healing, for restoration. We pray for comfort for those who've lost loved ones we just pray for your strength and grace for those who need that. And Lord, all of us carry burdens and needs on our hearts that aren't written down in the bulletin and perhaps that we haven't even shared. But you know them because you know our hearts. We know, Lord, that you care about the joys and the things that make us glad, Lord, as well as the things that cause us pain. Help us to trust you with those things. 
We lift today our church to you. We thank you for this great church. It's great because you are great, Lord. We pray that we would keep our eyes on you and follow you and the path you have for us. We pray that we would be one body as you are one, Lord. And one doesn't mean we're all the same, Lord, but it means that we have that common bond in you. Help us to love one another as you have loved us, as you've commanded. We pray for our denomination for the United Methodist Church, Lord. We pray for the church in America. And Lord, yes, we pray for the church worldwide. We know we have brothers and sisters in the faith, not just in our own church and denomination, but of all denominations. We have brothers and sisters of all different races and backgrounds and experiences. Lord, I pray for your beautiful church that we would be one and that we would witness to the world of who you are. We pray your good and perfect will to be done and that your church would be presented to you spotless, without fault, as a bride one day. We thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayers. We pray this in the name of your Son, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Help us to be generous givers, dear Lord both of our possessions and our lives, that we might make a difference in this community. We ask this through your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave all that he was, that we might know life in all its fullness. Amen.
invite you now to pass the peace and greet one another, and the children will be dismissed to children's worship. Precious ones, don't you like noise in the house of God? Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord Jesus Christ, Son, of the living God come into our hearts come into our hearts today and come into our hearts to stay in your precious name amen please stand for the reading of the gospel please stand Reading about the parable of the mustard seed and the parable of the yeast. Remembering that parables always are telling us something about God. Are telling us something about God. He put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds. But when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree. So that the birds of the air can come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Some years ago there was a movie entitled The Right Stuff. And you will remember it. It was about the early days of, uh, of the space uh, exploration. And uh, it was about some of the early astronauts. The essence of the movie was dealing with the question, with this tremendous opportunity, task, and challenge ahead of them, were they the right people, and did they have the right stuff? That is to say, did they have all they needed to meet and complete this tremendous challenge of going into space. I'm sure there are times when we have asked ourselves that question facing any challenge. I know I have. Uh, I ask myself that every Sunday I step into a pulpit. (laughs) Carol and I have also just started watching we just bought the DVDs of the program 1883. It is kind of the, if you've watched Yellowstone, I've watched Yellowstone a little bit, but I'm not a, one of those who, who, who's into it. But I've really, in a short period of time, gotten into 1883. 
it is a story really uh, leading into the dynasty that we that the Yellowstone story tells about but it's it's at the beginning when uh, immigrants are being led across this uh, vast land almost wilderness on their way to a place they believe they can realize their foolish dreams Sam Elliott one of my favorite movie stars of all time. I could watch him anytime. Uh, Tim McGraw and Faith Hill are the main stars in this drama. It is about putting these people, these immigrants, who can hardly, many of them cannot even speak English. Sam Elliott is the trail boss, I guess, and he's leading them across this country. And they meet all kinds of challenges. And Sam Elliott, his character, is constantly saying about the persons he is leading to this brave new land. He's constantly saying two things that I believe fit what I have to say this morning about this parable. He's constantly saying about those immigrants as they're in their wagon trains and they're making their way. He is constantly saying they don't know enough to make it. That is, he doesn't believe they are equipped with the skills they need to handle the challenges they're facing. They don't know enough to make it. And secondly, he says, they don't have enough to make it. In other words, they do not have the resources they need, right down to enough to eat, to make it. But yet, they're on their way, facing the challenges. Those two questions, they don't know enough, they don't have enough. In other words, they definitely are not well enough equipped to be successful at what they about what they are about they don't know enough they don't have enough now when I read this parable I'm trying to and I've preached on this parable I don't know how many times over the years but I've never asked myself the question that I've asked myself when I started looking at this parable for today's sermon. I've never asked myself this question. What prompted Jesus to teach this parable? So, in my imagination, one of two things. Was this simply an academic exercise on the part of Jesus? Was he secluded at some prayer time, he decided, now tomorrow on Wednesday's prayer meeting with my disciples, I'm going to teach this. So he writes out a syllabus and said, among the things I'm going to teach is the parable of the mustard seed and the uh, parable of the yeast. And I'm asking, my, is that what it was? Or is Jesus having to answer a question raised by Peter, James, John, Matthew, and all the rest of the twelve. I ask myself, have they suddenly come to terms with the fact that that which Jesus has asked them to do ain't going to be easy? I wonder if Peter may have been sitting around saying, am I hearing him correctly? He's talking about going out into all the world. And making disciples. And all there's only 12 of us. Is he talking about going around from village to village and healing? There's only 12 of us. How does he think? that just the 12 of us can do that much good. See, I, I kind of 
in my imagination, I'm, I'm thinking maybe Jesus was responding to their sense of being overwhelmed by the task at hand. Like, we need more than this. And I can see Jesus sitting down with them and saying, Peter, James, John, Matthew, and all the rest of you, gather around me just a minute. Do y'all know about the mustard seed? And I can see Jesus, maybe he had a mustard seed between thumb and finger. He said, do you know about the mustard seed, don't you? Did you know that it is the smallest of all the seeds? And yet when it is planted, it becomes a tree. You can get shade, birds of the air, nest in it. Don't you know about the mustard seed? Peter? It's powerful. I've been reading about mustard lately. Did you know, and I tell my wife this all the time, that mustard on a hot dog offsets the bad effects of the wiener? <laughs> Y'all responded just like she did. <laughs> now I got that by a good source. And so while I'm balancing out the guys who are saying eating hot dogs shortens your lifespan so much, I say, oh, no, it doesn't because I put a lot of mustard on my hot dog. <laughs> <laughs> mustard is powerful. The seed, read about it. Jesus probably was set among 12 people who just said, how in the world does he think we can do what he is asking us to do? He's even said he's going to go to Jerusalem and be crucified. What are we going to do then? When our leader's gone. I don't think Jesus was just telling this parable because it's a wonderful parable. I dare to think that Jesus was faced with 12 disciples who were trying to bear the weight or have had just discovered when he called us to be fishers of men, he didn't explain all this to us. So I think he said, Peter, now look here, look at this mustard seed, and did you know, in effect, all the faith you need to accomplish what I've asked you to do, everything, you, you just need about, you just need that much faith. And you will accomplish great, marvelous things for the kingdom of God. I think it was Jesus' way of saying to them and helping them understand in a moment when they were frightened of what future holds. A lot of that going around these days. Peter. Don't you know about the mustard seed? I think it was Jesus' way of telling those disciples, you can get a lot done for just a little. Amen. For just a little.
My daddy grew up poor, dirt poor. My grandfather, I thought, raised chickens until one day I learned at older age what he was raising was fighting roosters. He was a gambler down on the Tennessee River. He was a mean man. He almost beat my father to death as a boy. Had been for his older brother, I certainly wouldn't be here today. He was poor. He went to school barefooted. Eighth grade education. But he also had a lot of pride did the best he could do with what he had to do with. And when I was in high school, I was on a football team. I was a star. At least in my mind, I was a star. <laughs> Quarterback. We lifted weights at school and in the gym. And my uh, coach said, you all need to get weights at home so you can work out at home as well. And at the time, we still had Sears downtown Chattanooga. Sears downtown Chattanooga, as you can remember in those days, had everything. They had a section where they had weights, beautiful weights, dumbbells, barbells. So I approached my daddy, who worked shifts at Chattanooga DuPont. And by the way, with an eighth grade education, with what little he had to do with precious people, did you know that at the end of his time at DuPont, he was training college graduates to be shift managers? You know, you can just do a lot with just a little. I said, Daddy, I need some weights. Okay, son. One day I came home from school and he said, now, I want you to go out to the driveway around the side of the house and see what you see. And I just knew he had those weights from Sears. <laughs> I went out there. They weren't there. I said, what, what, what? He said, right over there. And I looked over there. And sure enough, there was a barbell. My daddy had taken two large can, empty cans of green beans filled them with concrete, and put a steel bar in between. I looked at him like, what are you talking about? And I said something, I can't remember exactly what, but I could see the hurt on his face. Haven't forgotten that. He said, all right. Get over there. I said, Daddy, this, this doesn't weigh hardly anything. Get over there then. And I want you to get over there, and I want you to pick up that weight, and I want you to do 125 curls. And he didn't ask me to do it. He, I knew he meant to go do it. I want to tell you, precious people, when I got through, it, through doing 125 curls with that uh, barbell of uh, concrete and two green, empty green bean cans. I had all the weight training I needed for any day. Amen. And that's what I used at home for the rest of my high school career. And for years when I'd come back home, I'd sometimes walk around the side just to see was the barbell still there. If my daddy taught me anything, he taught me this parable. He taught me this parable. You can do a lot with just a little. No matter what the challenge is. No matter what. Served the church some years ago in Brevard, North Carolina. During the time that Brevard, North Carolina was the number one retirement community, people coming to retire in the mountains in the United States of America. People from Florida 
were buying homes in Brevard sight unseen because somehow or other they saw a picture of a home hanging on a cliff up in the mount, off a cliff in the mountains. I mean, it was something to see. And in the church we were serving, people were joining from who had been steel executives, uh, who had owned pharmaceutical companies, who had, they were coming to Brevard to retire. And if you go in that part of the country today, Brevard, Hendersonville, Asheville, and everything, it is wild over there. I mean wild. People are still coming over there to retire in the mountains. The church I was serving had a mixture of people. It had the folk who had, in effect, could tell me that my ancestors came over that mountain from France and Scotland. They settled this place. Those people. In other words, this is our land. But they couldn't keep those folk from Pittsburgh, Connecticut, New York from settling in and becoming part of the church. And I had, a, in that church, that church was, was one of its great mission endeavors every year was to send teams on short-term mission trips. And one of the fellows was Fred. Fred was a younger man. All, he went on every mission trip he could go on. One day he came to me and he said, you know Don, that Don over there, you know, he's, he, he owned that, he retired, he owned that big pharmaceutical company that he sold to Johnson & Johnson. I said, yeah, I know Don. He said, you know, all Don ever do, does is come to church, Sunday school, sit in the pew. He doesn't do anything. He never goes on a mission trip at all, Fred was telling me. So I, one day I was talking to Don. I said, Don, did you know Fred thinks that you don't ever do anything in this church? He told me that he goes on these short-term mission trips all the time, and you just sit and worship and go to Sunday school, and you never do anything. Don looked at me and said, well, Doug, that's okay. Let's just let Fred keep on going on his short-term mission trips, and I will keep on paying for them. <laughs> you see, Fred couldn't afford to leave town, much less go on a short-term mission trip in Mexico. He couldn't buy the first piece, the first two for a short-term mission trip. So Don said, all right, let, old, let Fred keep going. I'll keep paying. Puts me in mind of Edwin Evan Hale, a statement Edwin, a man by the name of Edwin Evan Hale once made. I am only one. I cannot do everything. But that will not keep me from doing the one thing I can do. Don taught me this parable. You can do a lot with just a little. He also taught me to ask this question of my parishioners. What is the one thing you can do to benefit the kingdom of God right now, right here, at this time, in this place? How can you live out this beautiful parable? Parable of the mustard seed. I'm only one. Can't do everything. But that will not keep me from doing the one thing I can do for the glory of God, for the cause of Jesus Christ, for the work of the kingdom of God. Peter, James, and John, I can hear Jesus saying it now. Don't you know about the mustard seed? 
the tiniest of all seeds may be the most powerful of all seeds. Please stand for our hymn of commitment, number 102. Now thank we all our God, and after our benediction, we ask that you please remain seated for our postlude, which will conclude our service. pray. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion, fellowship, and empowerment of the Holy Spirit be with us this day and in the days to come. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.